The most shocking thing I've ever witnessed coming to the UK was the Muslim caste system. You've heard me right, the Muslim caste system. And this is something that shocks many new Muslims in the UK. I didn't say Islamic caste system. There is no caste system in Islam. I'm talking about Muslims. And as you know, Muslim doesn't always mean Islamic. You've probably heard things such as if you're a mochi from the shoemaker caste, you cannot marry into a Darzi family, a family of tailors. Well, it's possible, there's always exceptions, but not without causing tensions between families. And I've heard cases where kids have been disowned and even people have been killed because they married outside of their caste. Hello and welcome. My name is William. I am a sociologist at the University of Warwick in the UK. And it's also been 15 years I'm Muslim and I've been doing research on Muslims in France, in the, in the UK, in North America. And it saddens me as a believer to see that for some people, no matter how good you are, how rich you are, how educated you are, how pious you are, if you from the wrong caste, you're going to have a very hard time with some people. And it's not only amongst adults, it's people from my generation and even younger ones. So before we continue, I just wanted to repeat that there is nothing Islamic in the caste system. It is something completely cultural that people have made up. And I'll show you the history of this Muslim caste system because Islam itself does not allow the discrimination according to ethnicity or social and economic status. Islam actually came to abolish these traditions, these pagan traditions, but as you probably know by now, old habits die hard. The Prophet himself, peace be upon him, married outside of his culture many times, and he married people of a much lower social status. So some people would argue it's actually sunnah to marry people from other cultures. I also want to say that this is not something exclusively South Asian. If you are familiar with uh, West Africa, you know that some Muslims in West Africa, not all of them, also practice a similar kind of discrimination according to uh, caste or profession. You may be familiar with the cast of the Keita, Koulibaly, the Forgeron, and so on. Then you have also some Muslims in Southeast Asia discriminating according to lineage, whether you are a descendant of the Prophet or not. But today I want to talk about things I have directly witnessed and a context I'm familiar with, which is the UK. First of all, what is a caste? Throw away the dictionary, we're talking sociology today. And I would say there's three criteria as defining a caste. First, it is a system of social stratification. So it is a hierarchical division of the society according to various criteria, which can change depending on the country, the religion, and so on. Second, it is hereditary. If you are born into a caste, there is no way for you to escape from it. And third, it confers individuals some rights, privileges and prohibitions, meaning that you may or may not be able to do the job you like or marry the person you like. The most famous occurrence of the caste system is what we call the Hindu caste system, quote marks, because this is not actually Hindu. Uh, the, this division of caste, which is known as Varna, so you have the Brahmin, the Kshatriya, the Vaishya, Shudra and the Dalits, so the Untouchables. It was never rooted in the foundational texts of what we call Hinduism, like the Vedas and so on. This system was originally much more flexible, meaning that if you were born into a certain caste, you could grow out of this caste and belong to another one. The time where these castes got very strict and solid boundaries only came with the British colonization. It is actually the British colonizers that they find a very strict caste system enforced by law. And because the colonization affected Hindus, Sikhs and Muslims in the subcontinent, this very hardcore caste system has transpired onto Sikh and Muslim communities. Although in Sikhi and Islam there is no social division acceptable according to social status. So among Muslims you have two types of stratification. The older one 
which is lineage, and the second one, which is more recent and we just mentioned, is with according to socioeconomic status. Some people pride themselves of being of Arab descent or descendants of the Prophet, peace be upon him. The highest ranks are those who are direct descendants of Ali and Fatima, which are called the Saids. So you may have seen the particular like Said affixed to various names. Then just underneath, there are people descendants of the tribe of the Quraysh, which have usually the surname Sheikh affixed to their name. And then just beneath them, you have people of Turco-Mongol descent, so the uh, conquerors of the subcontinent, which are known with the surname Mughal. And just underneath, you have the Pathan. So all of these people are known as Ashraf or Sharif, which roughly means noble. And some ulama, some religious scholars, enforced these divisions with fatwas. In the 14th century, during the Delhi Sultanate, a certain Ziauddin Barani, for example, wrote a fatwa granting higher positions, higher ranks and privileges to those descendants of the Prophet over others. And more shockingly, in legal matters, their rights of those descendants of the Prophet would have precedence over the Sharia. Meaning that if you were in some legal trouble and you happened to be a descendant of the Prophet, well, at that time you could get away with it. So I haven't come across many discriminations according to lineage in the UK, because the most prevalent I've seen and witnessed are those for a social and economic status. So you may have heard terms such as the Rajputs, the Jats, Darzi, the tailors, or the Mochis, shoemakers, Kumar, the potters, or the Qureshi, the butchers. Oh, my friend is a Mochi or he's a Kumar. He wants to marry someone who is a Rajput or a Jat and he's going to have so many troubles. So this is called the Biradari system which is a direct inheritance from the, remember, the British Hindu caste system, which was kept by rulers for keeping people under control. So this Biradri system is not related to people's actual profession. You can be an accountant, you can be a banker and still belong to the class of the Kumar or the Mochi. It's just at some point in your ancestral lineage, there was someone in the family who was a Kumar or a Mochi, so a shoemaker or a potter. And because this was a craft transmitted from generation to generation, so the surname kept along the line. It's very much like the English or any European surname system where you have things like Thatcher, Potters, which refer to people's ancestral professions at some point in history. So the arguments people give is, for example, when you are of a higher caste and uh, you meet a family of a lower caste, you, people often say, oh, these people are so rough, they're so rude, they don't have manners, uh, they are not so uneducated, they're barbaric, and this kind of arguments. And for people who are from lower caste, you often, you know, say the higher caste are you know, such arrogant people. Oh, you know, they think they're better than anyone else and so on. I mean, you probably know what, what I mean. And because it is inherited, no matter if you, let's say, you are a mochi and you have a PhD or you have become a millionaire or, I don't know, you're just, you know, the perfect person following Islam. If you want to marry into a family of Rajputs or Jats, even if these are just taxi drivers and cleaners, so you will have a very hard time just because you belong to a lower caste. Of course, there is always exceptions and nowadays, well, money usually speaks louder than caste. I mean, even, you know, money speaks louder than piety nowadays and good character. So this is why people end up in very messed up relationships. But this is another story. Reading the PhD thesis of a certain Ahmed Usman at the University of Leeds. Uh, so he made uh, re his research in Punjab in a village about the caste system and he uh, recorded this uh, testimony from a villager saying that even if a kammi, so it comes from the word come to work, uh, so a kammi is an artisan laborer, so even if a kammi acquires a hundred acres of land, he remains a kammi. 
And Zamindar, so the landowners, will always consider him as a lower person. A Zamindar who owns one acre of land would think, if a Kami has but two acres, so what? After all, he remains a Kami. They do not accept us as equals. So this system is based on social economic status, but to make things more complicated, it is also interwoven with tribes and clans. So you may have heard the like, tribes of Arain, Awan, Bati, and these clans can be made of people of different castes. For example, the Bati, they would have Rajputs and Jats uh, among them. But well, according to observations, social economic status has usually precedence over clan and tribe. Now you would think, how would some scholars, how would some ulama justify such discriminations which have no basis in the Qur'an and the Hadith? Scholars have been using this very vague concept of kafar, which means equality, compatibility, something along the lines of that. Saying that, you know, if two people are getting married, they should be as similar as possible. Well, I'm not sure if you ask a couple therapist if it were a clinical psychologist that it's actually true, but that was the main thinking. Also, people advocating for maintaining this kind of discrimination often quote a hadith uh, found in Sunan Ibn Majah saying that the Prophet said a woman should be married for four things, her wealth, her lineage, her beauty, and her religion. But they often forget the last part of the hadith saying that if you choose for religion, you then you will prosper. When it comes to lineage, well, some sociologists like Abdul Hamid al-Zaini in 1977 observed that uh, those who argue in favor of discriminating uh, according to lineage say that, believe that, the descendants of the Prophet pass on a superior knowledge. Let me quote, they claim to be not only the mediators between man and God, but the representation of God's reality on earth. Like, just like let it sink in, the representation of God's reality on earth. Furthermore, spirituality cannot be attained unless you are a descendant of Prophet Muhammad. This is what they believe. And also, when it comes to specifically the subcontinent, uh, Ashraf Ali Thanvi, one of the grand muftis of Darulum Deoband, so he wrote a book called Bahishti Zevars, which is one of the most comprehensive uh, books of Hanafi, Hanafi fiqh, sorry, uh, written somewhere in the 19th century. And he mentions in his book that if you consider people for marriage, you should consider in order of priority, first lineage, then Islam, piety, wealth, and profession or occupation. So this is not interpretation of Hadith of Quran, this is just uh, a rule, just I can remember the fatwa made in the 14th century, and you know, people should look in priority at these things, you know, lineage, wealth and stuff, uh, and in addition to Islam and piety. And you look at some other religious figures like Sayyid Allah Maududi, founder of the jamaat islami so he said, so, do you think that the egalitarianism of Islam means that every man and woman can be married uh, to each other just because they're Muslim? Listen what he says. So, do you think they can get married without taking care of their compatibilities? There should be a commonality of nature, religiosity, family status, social and cultural values, respect in the society, financial status, and everything needs to be carefully equated. And then he says, if you implement the rule that every progeny of Adam is equal in this case, then thousands of households will get destroyed. Again, the destruction of the family unit. Who says that? You know, what is this kind of argument? You know, you've, we've heard it like so many times, but you know, it was used already in the past so many times. So you see, we are talking about hundreds of years hundreds of years of this tradition which has no grounding in the Qur'an and the Hadith. I mean, no grounding. People interpret things. You will see many people saying that, no, there is no uh, social, gender, economic bias or racial bias in the interpretations of the Qur'an and the Hadith. But the caste system 
is a clear proof that yes, you know, people have interpreted the Quran and the Hadith and distorted them, made rules around them to justify discrimination around their own criteria. None of these discriminations come from Islam, but people have written fatawas. They have written uh, books of jurisprudence saying that yeah, this should be implemented this discrimination, knowing clearly that yeah, the Prophet married outside of his culture many times and married people of a much lower social status. So I hope you're not feeling too nauseous right now, but you know this is a feeling many new Muslims uh, experience here in the UK when they realize that yeah, people, as even the younger ones, adhere to such a, a caste system for many. According to my observations, it's very much replaced by pure uh, social and economic discrimination, meaning that no, they don't name the castes anymore, but they would look, you know, at who has the most material possessions, the bigger house, the most expensive car, who earns six figures. I mean, you know the narrative. It's not any better, to be honest. And that's why some scholars like Mohammed Nizami from Hackney mentions that most Muslims in Britain, they don't practice Islam, but they practice a form of Hinduism that looks like Islam. You know, it's, you, you know, people worship money. That's not a, nothing Islamic. But you know, they just you know pray five times a day. They go on Hajj like seven times to get forgiven. I don't know how many times, and they say that yeah, this is, we're Muslim. This is Islam. What we do is a like representation of Islam. And you know, when you thought it was the end, did you know that there is also a hierarchy among Muslim converts to Islam? But we'll leave that for another video. Moral of the story: Islam is very simple people make it very complicated. I know it can be a mess, especially if you're new to the faith, but the key is trying to discern what comes from Islam, what comes from God, and what comes from people. If you're able to make that difference and realize that, no, not every Muslim behaves in an Islamic way, then you've done 50% of the job. In some cases, it can save your life. I'm talking from experience. Thank you for watching. Always practice your critical thinking skills and take care of yourselves.